Hi, welcome to Paleo Nerds Podcast. I'm David Strassman. And I'm Ray Troll. Hey, Ray, how are you? Good, Dave. I've had a lot of coffee. I'm uh, I'm good to go, man. Feeling good. Good, good, good. Yeah, I've had my coffee. I've had my juice. And you're still in Alaska. I'm still sitting here in my living room in Ketchikan. Yeah, I'm sitting on my couch, man. All right. So the paleontological discovery of the week is the Spinosaurus can swim. Have you seen that? I I have, man. That is that is cool. That is badass. Why would they think that it didn't swim before? Did they find some sort of skeletal structure? Or Well, they knew that it ate fish and stuff. It's got this long, pony snout, and they'd find maybe a few fish bits around it and stuff, and it seemed to be in these marine environments. But no, the rule has always been that dinosaurs are terrestrial. They don't swim, so they're not plesiosaurs. This is one of the distinctive features. And this guy, now they've found this new tail section. And it shows that the tail is very broad, like broader than you would expect. And it's basically kind of a huge paddle. It's like, oh, they did swim. Or we think they did. Much broader than a crocodile or an alligator. It's kind of like a vertical beaver tail, if you will. (laughs) So it's going the other way. Yeah. Beavers, you know, they have the flat tail that way. But this is mammals and reptiles tend to do these different things in the water. Didn't you explain to me on one of our fossiling adventures about the fact that mammals, their tails go up and down? And that you got it, baby. reptiles, yeah. they go back and forth. At least these are creatures in the water. Yeah, there's that waddling action. And actually, with. So I, I once talked to an evolutionary biologist about this, and they brought this idea up that basically, if you look at reptiles, marine reptiles that have returned to the sea because of that sort of sideways kind of pattern to their walking. You imagine a lizard going side to side at that. As they returned to the sea, they kept that that gait, if you will. And so it was began to be a, a vertical tail. So you see all these marine reptiles from the uh, Mesozoic, and uh, they've got vertical tails. So you're talking the ichthyosaurs and the Lyplurodons and the plesiosaurs. Right. Oh, wait, but a plesiosaur has kind of a, a lizard tail. Yeah, it? plesiosaurs don't really have much of a tail fluke, but ichthyosaurs and mosasaurs have these vertical tails. And they look, an ichthyosaur looks almost exactly like a swordfish. Or a fat dolphin. Yeah, or a fat dolphin. But if you look at marine mammals, so the whales, the dugongs, the manatees, you know, the dolphins, they all have these horizontal tails. So wait, but how does that translate from a... Their rear legs have evolved away. Okay, but how does the horizontal, the up and down of a horizontal tail, right, like you'd see a mermaid, <laughs> how, how does that translate from a walking mammal compared to a walking reptile? Well, it's sort of that hand-over-hand motion that you have hand over hand, not side to side. So the rump would go up and down. It's like a gallop. Think of a gallop. You're stepping, stepping one foot in front of the other. And these are mammals that are now doing it. They have a different gait pattern. So somehow with the vertebrae and the whole, the, the rear legs begin to disappear. So whales used to have legs, you know, I mean, rear legs and used to have front limbs too as well. But the front limbs are now gigantic fins with a humpback whale they're really huge pectoral fins but basically and i was thinking about this dave i was thinking all right so originally fish the original fish that gave rise to all the vertebrates and and the vertebrates that left the water and then became the amphibians and reptiles but i was thinking is there any fish any bony fish that does not have a vertical tail has a horizontal tail like a mammal has a horizontal tail and then i went aha there is a group of fish that have that locomotion, but they don't have a horizontal tail. Basically, their eyes, you, you get what I'm talking about here? Wait, are you talking about the little mud skippers? Their eyes went from one side of the head. Oh, huh? yes, a big, huge halibut, a flounder or a halibut. You got it. You got it. Oh, so basically... Yeah, but you know what? No, no, but I'm just yeah. saying they actually have a horizontal... Yeah, is that the weirdest thing to see a halibut has the eye has literally migrated through evolution from yep. one side of the fish. I'd like to see that fossil where the eye is actually at the top, where it hasn't gone. Like it's halfway. halfway. Yeah, it's halfway. You know, there's got to be a transitional fossil. There's got to be. It's you know, and, uh, and that is the fantastic thing about paleontology and this, this whole incredible uh, 
paleo revolution that's been going on all you know there used to be a lack a lack of abundance should i say of uh transitional fossils like show me the half creature that gave rise to the amphibians and we are finding all those missing links and it's been really cool to find them I think one episode we should find the expert who can tell us what gaps are missing and what do we need to find and, and send out the next cadre of paleontologists to go find those missing links. Yeah, and sometimes it's just that there's just not the right strata, they're not the right preservation. When we spoke to Kirk Johnson, who's director of the Smithsonian, he said that think of the amount of animals that exist in any place at any one time. Think about the African savanna. How many billions of pounds of animals are standing there, running there, sleeping there right this very moment, right? right. So then you, th and that's just on one day. Then think about how many lived and died in a hundred years. We'll go back to the end of the Cretaceous where you have every kind of dinosaur. So fossils are rare, but I don't know how really rare they are. We just have to find them in there. Well, there are still a lot of big gaps out there. You know, we were talking about the more you ask, it seems the less you know, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so listen, uh, our guest today is an expert on something that you salivate over, and that is kind of like your spirit animal. Yeah, yeah. Your spirit animal is the ratfish, and she is a ratfish expert. And we, we really talk about fishy stuff, but we don't get into deep time. But tell me, why is a ratfish really related to deep time? Well, I like to think of them as living fossils, creatures. As I found, I was fascinated with this fish as I went deeper into the topic of this fish. This fish somehow had chosen me and uh, as my spirit fish, spirit animal. But I began to realize that these are one of the few creatures that have survived two mass extinctions that basically took everything out. And basically there's a lot of, there's a lot of creatures that made it through the Cretaceous extinction. So birds and all that. But basically in terms of when you start looking at the fish, the fish that are pretty much unchanged that go way back to the Paleozoic and they survived the Permian-Triassic extinction. Now remember that extinction took out some estimates 90, 95% of all life on the planet and ratfish made it through. They were around before that. So you don't see many of those creatures. And this is pretty much like looking at a creature from, let's say the, almost like the Devonian. This is a 300 million year old creature and it just looks distinctly different. And that's because it's from basically kind of two worlds ago before the Cretaceous extinction wiped out stuff on the planet and before the Permian just devastated, just destroyed life on the planet. And there's a restart, a reboot. But this is along with like lungfish and coelacanths and hagfish sharks. and lampreys. Those are, no, sharks. What? Sir, sharks really do. Most of the sharks we have today living in the oceans date uh, back to the Jurassic and oh, the Cretaceous. Oh, I didn't know that. So a lot of these guys, so yeah, they're recent. And really after the asteroid hit 66 million years ago, we see a vast radiation of bony fish species. But anyways, I like to think of ratfish as living fossils, messengers from deep, 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 deep time. And they're just funky cool, man. So who are we talking to today? Dr. Dominique Didier. She's a professor of biology and ichthyology at Millersville University of Pennsylvania. Icky. Icky? Icky. Oh, Icky, meaning fish. All right, cool. Um, I think we should give her a call. What do you think? Hey, Dave. Meet Dominique Didier. She's an ichthyologist, man. So meet Dominique. Hi, nice to meet you. Pleasure. How does one get to be an ichthyologist? Is this a dream come true for you? Well, not exactly. Let's just say um, when I was in college, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to continue my education and go to grad school. And I was actually really interested in bats. I've always had a longstanding passion for bats. 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 Love them. Love bats. <laughs> have loved them since... I was very young. And so I chose my graduate school because there was a bat expert there. My backup plan was to work with this other guy named Willie Bemis who studied fish. And I only did that because I had done a senior 
college project on this fish that I hated. It was really ugly. It was called a ratfish. I swore when I graduated from college, I'd never look at another ratfish. This guy, Willie, said, you should take my ichthyology class. You know, you need the instructor's permission. And I pretty much just talked my way into it. I said, oh, he wants me in this class for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out he was sitting in the room. I had never met him before. <laughs> <laughs> He said, yes, I do. So I, I took his ichthyology class, and the rest was history. I was like, oh, man, skip the bats. It's all about the fish. But they're so slimy. Dominique, you and I have known each other for 25-plus years now, something like that? Oh, probably, yeah, at least. <laughs> how did we come to meet? I'm trying to remember how we. I reached out to you. Do you recall yeah. when this weird guy from Alaska got I touch do, me? I do. I think at the time I was... I just started my first job at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia, and I had known about you. You knew you about know, me? Oh. Yeah. I mean, I had, you know, being out on the West Coast, I'd seen your art, you know, I'd seen you, you know, spawn to you die t-shirts and all that. And people that I would encounter say, oh, you should meet this guy, Ray Troll. And I'd say, oh, yeah, I've seen some of his art. So I, you know, I knew you were out on the radar. And um, one day, lo and behold, I get a package Ah, that's right. I sent I, you a cool package of stuff, some fan mail. Yeah, and I still have that lab coat, and I wear it in the lab when I'm teaching all the time. But you were one of the world's few, if only, ratfish specialists. I'd always thought there were like hundreds of ratfish scientists out there, but no, it's a very narrow little group. And I'd caught this fish. I'd been reading about this fish. I'd seen it. I was just, I was obsessed with it, and I wanted to know more about it. And I, people were telling me you were the expert. Yes. So I reached out to you. It's the Mutual Admiration Society. <laughs> Dominique, what is the moment where you decided that ichthyology is your future? Well, I just think it was the minute I walked in the classroom. I mean, I just realized like all this diversity of fish. There's so many kinds of fish out there and and they do amazing things and they live everywhere on the planet and they've evolved and adapted and it's mind blowing. Was there a void in ratfish science at the time that needed to be? Yeah, that was kind of why I got into my project as an undergraduate, because I started doing, you know, my background literature research, and there was nothing being published on these things. I mean, nothing. <laughs> I mean, the best paper was published in 1906. I thought, Whoa. Wow. I said, this is an area where I could actually make a contribution. There's not too much competition. I don't really like <laughs> competition, so that worked for me. So you are a ratfishologist? Well, that's an interesting term. I've never heard that one. Uh, yeah, I'm a ratfish expert. Well, tell me, what, what is a ratfish? Well, I kind of know. It's a chimera? It's a chimera, Dave. A chimera. I try to teach you these things. You're always yeah. correcting me, Ray. <laughs> well, that's, that's half the fun of being around you, Dave. When will I ever learn? I thought a chimera is the thing that I have a little fire on my front patio. What? No, that's a chiminea. Oh, Chimenea. Oh. <laughs> Dominique, what is a chimera? Can you uh, educate Dave on what a chimera is, a.k.a. a ratfish, and uh, what do they look like? Well, a uh, chimera is a type of fish. It's related to sharks, but doesn't look like a shark. They typically have kind of large heads, and then their bodies sort of taper. And in most of them, it turns into a whip-like tail. But this Australian species I was telling you about does have a tail more like a shark where it points up. It has oh. a big lobe up and a small lobe on the bottom. And they have strange tooth plates and big bulbous eyes. And a very bulbous nose, almost a goofy looking nose. Well, some of them have the bulbous noses, but some of them have noses shaped like a little plow or a hoe. And oh. some of them have little snouts that stick way out like a spear. So wow. they're... Pretty weird. And why are the lateral lines not lateral? They're like, they almost look like a jigsaw puzzle. Oh, well, the lateral line, that's a good question. Now, for people that don't know what the lateral line is, it's a canal system on the head and trunk of all fish. Um, and usually this canal system is enclosed and water flows through the canal system. And that's how fish detect water motion in the area around them. It's a sensory organ. Yeah, it's a sensory organ, a mechanoreceptor. Is it based on electrical impulses or cilia or feeling? or? It is cilia-based. The sensory organ consists of clumps of cells with cilia on the top. And when the cilia are moved by the water movement, that sends an electrical impulse is detected as water motion. But it's a mechanoreceptor. They also can detect electricity using a very the same kind of sensory cell, but a totally different organ. 
So the, the sensory modality is different. That's what I was wondering about. A lateral line is basically sensing vibrations or water movement, but they have these electroreceptors. They're sensing electricity. On their snouts. Yeah, on their snouts. And the electroreceptors are totally different from the lateral line. We humans don't have, we don't see electricity. These are animals that can see electricity. What's that all about? Well, it's pretty cool. Um, and it turns out being able to detect electricity is a very primitive trait among us backboned creatures. And different creatures do it different ways. But in terms of the sharks and the ratfish, um, they're detecting bioelectric fields. So what that means is every critter in the ocean is producing electricity. Think about it. Your heart is an electrical, right? How do we get our heart started? We put an electrical paddle on it. Stand clear. So our heart, when it beats, it produces an electrical signal. Now, we can't detect it, but the electroreceptors of a shark are so sensitive, they can detect the heartbeat of a fish if it's, like, buried in the sand underneath them. So in a sense, they can see electricity? No, they're feeling it. They're feeling the electrical field because that fish buried in the sand is producing an electrical field around itself. Muscle movements produce an electrical field. Your brain waves are an electrical field. So the shark will detect it or the ratfish and hone in on where that creature is hidden. Now, the sharks and rays and ratfish are cartilaginous and the rest of the fishies are bony, correct? Yes. Did they split off from a single ancestor, or did they evolve divergently? A common ancestor, yeah. How far back in time, Dominique? Oh, wow. Well, um... What day? (laughs) What day? That would have been Tuesday. No, um... (laughs) Well, actually, the first evidence of fishy ancestors, we see them in the Paleozoic, in the Cambrian, 600, 650 million years ago, sometime with the Cambrian explosion. But the sharks and the elasmo the elasmo branks the uh, chondrichthyes actually slow down slow down a what elasmosaurus what it's all greek to me the cartilaginous fishes are known as the chondrichthyes right cartilage skeleton correct yep as it c h c h r o n d chondrite chondrichthyes in the ocean we have bony fish and we have cartilaginous fish and we have a few jawless fish just a couple of those left but that's a lamprey eel uh, lamprey is not an eel. And hagfish are jawless. Hagfish. They call them slime eels. Right. But, but they're not eels either. Quick aside. There are two groups of living jawless, elongate, eel-like animals in the oceans. But they're not eels. Hagfish and lampreys. Although superficially alike, hagfish and lampreys are very different. Lampreys are clearly vertebrates. They latch onto fishes and suck their blood, while a hagfish is the only known living animal that have a skull, but no vertebral column. Regardless, They'd both have trouble sitting in a chair. In this whole world, what came first, the shark or the ratfish, I guess? That's what I'm asking. I don't think we really know. I mean, I wouldn't say there's a first sort of situation. At the time when the chondrichthyes were really diversifying in the Carboniferous, you know, 350, 375 million years ago, there's tons of them on the planet. We know this from fossils. So there were probably lots of experimental forms. We know that they died out. Right. And at that time, there was there was one common ancestor that that did lead to all the descendants that became the rat fishes and the sharks, etc. I like to think of ratfish as living fossils. Is that correct? I mean, they're virtually unchanged from deep time, right? Yeah, yeah. If you look at some of the fossils from way, way back, they look just like living ratfish. But wait a minute. Cartilage doesn't survive very well in the fossil record compared to a a bone. Yeah, there's a few places in the world where you can get these exceptionally preserved fossils and and find them. Um, There's some places around Montana that have some really good uh, deposits where you can find them. That's where a lot of the, the shark fossils do come from. There's also shark fossils in the... Uh, Scotland has some very beautiful fossils down New Mexico, too. They were so well-preserved. You can sometimes see the soft tissue. You can see the shape of the body and the fins and everything. You can even see the color patterns in some of those bear gulch fossils. Yeah, yeah. The striping, the spots. They're, they're absolutely incredible fossils. You mean skin, skin impressions or? Skin impressions and actually the coloration, the, so the, there's tiger striping on some of these fossils from of rat uh, bear gulch. Or sharks? Well, the relatives at the time. Yeah, yeah, and, and you can see even pigment inside the body, like uh, remnants of circulatory systems and things like that, you know. Wow. Blood, yeah. I mean, they're pretty amazing fossils. 
So why does an animal change so little through time? So basically ratfish start getting their form and their shape way back in the uh, Carboniferous yet they don't change hardly you know. they change very little they've been successful in their body form and that has not facilitated change why change that kind of sums it up in a way and i think to add on that you know i think one of the misconceptions is we have this idea that evolution has to occur this is a process and there's only one way to describe it and if it doesn't occur that way, then something's wrong. But what we're really appreciating is that the forces of, of evolution or the forces that act on animals or that they're existing within that, that promote evolutionary change, they're different for every single organism. And, and different organisms are going to respond differently, even within the same environment. So some may evolve very rapidly, some may not. And, and we don't know why some do or don't. So just because evolution isn't just a, a one size fits all, if we should say. They maybe achieve a certain state of perfection, and why change? But they are changing, though. When you look at you know, the rate at which the genes are changing, it's just not happening very quickly. You have to be real successful to survive the Permian extinction event and the KT extinction event. And there are little change since then, and there's not very many of those vertebrates. Well, there is a coelacanth. That's another one, living right. fossil. That's a pretty But cool there's one. not many. Not right? many. No, you're right. Wait. Isn't it true libertarians have slow evolution? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to go there. <laughs> These species that were discovered, the new species off of New Caledonia and New Zealand and Australia, were you involved in the research at those locations or was it through other scientists? Were you in a submersible? Um, no. This is the interesting thing about, you know, a lot of, of what I do or what taxonomists do or discovering new species. We tend to think of, you know, you you literally put a, a submersible out there or throw a hook and line out and you reel in and thing and you go, wow, it's a new species. And it's not really <laughs> like that. <laughs> um, I was working in those countries, but usually it was some of the scientists at the museums there had recognized. They said, gee, this looks different. Let's call someone who's an expert on these fish to tell us if it's a new species. Or I have just literally been walking the halls at a museum and pulled a jar off a shelf and go, oh, that's a new species. And they're things that have been collected a long time ago, and they're just sitting around. But it takes the right person to know that there's something new. And how do you discern a new ratfish species? Well, you know, that, that's a tricky thing. How, how do you know at what point this is something different from something else? I use morphology. There's a lot of different kinds of data you can use. I mean, some people use genetics to determine it's a new species. But I look at, you know... The, you know, the basic things like color and size and shape and take a lot of metrics and determine that this combination of metrics, it does take an expert, someone who's like, as I say, touched and fondled more ratfish than anyone else. <laughs> <sighs> Just so you know, we're about to dive into the details of ratfish mating habits, which may not be suitable for younger audiences. So please feel free to fast forward through the next six minutes. Speaking of fondling ratfish, Ray told me that you have studied the sex life and reproduction of the ratfish. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. They're pretty it's, sexy animals, aren't they? They're very sexy. That actually was one of the appeals, I have to admit. What? When I first got this ratfish and noticed that it had lots and lots of gear, shall we say. <laughs> Claspers like sharks? Yeah, so, you know, sharks... All the chondrichthys have what are called claspers or intromittent organs, which are basically in males. Only males have them. They're extensions from the pelvic fins, and they insert them into the female, and they transmit the sperm into the female. Internal fertilization. We know some other animals that do the same kind of reproduction. Are you referring to penises? Is it a penis? Can I no. say that? Yeah, yeah. You can, can, you, you can say penis. I can say that. So a clasper is not a penis, but it works like a penis. Yeah, it would be what we'd call analogous. It's not homologous in that analogous. it shares a common evolutionary origin. It functions in the same way as we think of a mammalian penis. In that, are they ex they're external, correct? Yeah, they hang off the fish, you know. And where is the sperm stored? Inside the the testes, which are inside the body. Okay, well, how does the sperm get from the testes to the claspers? Well, you know, there's plumbing in there. So <laughs> once, well, so the males. 
will come up to the female and engage with the female. Usually she's not too excited about this, so they usually use a variety of different grappling hooks, if you will, <laughs> to get to them. Like yeah. in ratfish, we'll talk about ratfish specifically. So the ratfish will have, they have a, a clasp or what we call a frontal tenaculum. They have this little structure on their head. It looks something like a medieval torture device, like one of those maces. Whoa. Big spikes on a ball. Pokes out of their head, right? Yeah, pokes out of the top of their head between their eyes. Like an anglerfish type thing or? I guess if you want to imagine something sticking out of the top of the head like that. Yeah, but it, but it's kind of short and stubby. It's not a gigantic thing. You know, maybe half an inch long. No, half an inch to an inch long. On, on what? A uh, An 18-inch fish? A 20-inch fish? 24, 30-inch, yeah. Right, okay. It's also called a tenaculum, right? Yeah, frontal tenaculum. And they can move this thing. And what does it do? Well, they can move it up and down, and, and it's only been observed once, but it appears that they use once. that to grasp the fleshy part of the female's fin. And then, yes, yes. And that cool it, Ray. Gives them a, a, a grasping point, and then they wrap around her body, getting their bellies facing each other. And now, yes. usually she's not real excited about this, so she's very reluctant. So then they have these pouches in front of their pelvic fins, which have these little <laughs> blades called pre-pelvic tenacula. And they have little spikes on them. So they evert these little blades out and anchor themselves to her belly. So basically they're coming off of his hips, right? So they're kind of essentially hooking yeah. into the belly. They're hooking, but they're not they're not breaking the skin. They've observed scratches in the skin, so they probably do like, you know, scratch at her. I, I you know, no one's been that close to see, you know, like what level of hooking on this does. But anyway, they they evert those and that helps anchor them. And then they take their claspers, which are the extensions coming off of their pelvic fins. And usually in sharks, it's just a single rod. But ratfish, they're forked. How many do they have? Forked like a possum's penis? Mm, even more deeply forked. You know, like a possum's penis is just forked at the tip. This is like a deep, long fork. Whoa. Like a tuning fork. It looks a bit like a tuning fork, if you want to think of that. My God, evolution is crazy. The spiky tips, and it's very fleshy, so they can they engorge. You know, there's like like they can be engorged, like like getting an erection in a way. Just the fleshy part, like the whole thing, doesn't. But just the fleshy tips, and again, that probably helps them anchor inside the female. So they get all excited. They're they've got the girl. They're holding her by their the girl grabbing head device. They got the hooks in them in front of their on their hips, and then they have fish. Don't have hips, Ray. Well, they kind of do, Dave. But more about that later. Um, Whatever. But they have the two claspers split into two. So are there four claspers then? No, no, no. Each each clasper is a single unit. You know. Is there one vaginal opening? Two oviducts. Ah. They don't have a vagina. It's an oviduct. Right. Or is yeah. it a um, cloaca? No, that's a frog. <laughs> yeah. No, they have to have a cloaca. Right. Wow. Okay. So what I often say is, imagine that you're trying to have sex in outer space, but you can't use your arms. So how are you going to hook on to each other? What are you going to use? And sharks, when they have sex, they bite and they hold on with their teeth and they tear at the female. And it's if you look at if you Google up shark sex, it's some it's bad, it's violent. And I often think that the ratfish is much more of a gentleman because he's using this little head device, the tenaculum, to grab on to the female ever so gently and then indulge in, you know, what comes naturally. In all of humanity's history, we've only observed ratfish sex once. As far as I know. How many fish species uh, have sex? In, in... <laughs> well, they all do. Hold on, no. How many fish species have sex compared to the ones that just lay eggs and deposit sperm on a coral branch somewhere? You mean internal fertilization. Correct. Um, quite a lot. I, I, I don't know the exact number, but there are quite a few different species. Like, there's several species of bony fish that have... A variety of types of what are called gonopodia, which are, again, special structures to transfer sperm. And females have uh, ways to, you know, um, rear the eggs inside of them. You know, some even do, you know, uh, what's known as larviparous. Male seahorses? Male seahorses will have the eggs inside them, you know, and they transfer the eggs. In that case, they're not transferring the sperm to the female, but the female is transferring her eggs you know, the male fertilizes the eggs and then she transfers the eggs to his pouch. But but so there are a lot of varieties of sort of an internal fertilization that occur in different fishes. It's not as common, though, as it is, let's say, 
I'm amazed at the variety of ways to procreate amongst fishes. It's absolutely astonishing. Yeah, they live in, they have so many diverse habitats, so there's all different adaptations. Well, what what comes next? Uh, the little ratfish baby? Uh, come on, we didn't get to what it's all about. You know, it's, it's about making more fish. And so what happens next? Well, um, the eggs are fertilized inside the female. Okay. And as the egg passes through the reproductive tract, it meets up with the sperm. And a covering is produced over the egg. It's produced by what's known as the shell gland. What a surprise. And it produces this material that surrounds the egg. And then the female, she'll only lay two eggs at a time, one from each oviduct. Are they like shark eggs? Shark egg sacs? Yeah, in terms of the composition. But every species has a different shape. Like even shark egg sacs, they're all different shapes depending on the species. And the same with the ratfish. Some of them are big leaf-shaped things. Some of them are spindle-shaped. You know, they have different shapes for them. And each one of these egg sacs will contain one egg. And the egg is like, you know, it doesn't have as much... It, it, like the yolk is the size of a chicken egg yolk, to give you a sense of the size of that. Wow. They can be well over six inches long. Wow. Yeah. But they come, they're like kind of folded up inside the female, and then they kind of pop out, and then once they get in the ocean, and they kind of harden up. And, and then the little embryo will take months to develop. So a, a ratfish living at uh, 1,800 feet depth where does that egg case go? Does it sink? Could it theoretically sink to 10,000 feet or is it buoyant or? Well, this is where things get kind of tricky. Um, we know that they lay the eggs and they lay on the bottom, but for the vast majority of species, we have absolutely no idea where those eggs are. The only time we've ever collected the eggs is when they accidentally get caught in a trawl. And whether or not that's a major egg laying site or whether it's just an accidental catch of an egg, nobody knows. Well, that being said, we do know that the species known as the elephant fish, the calorinchids, the ones that have kind of a plow or a hoe-shaped snout, they live in Australia and in New Zealand and, you know, off the coast of the southern part of South America and the southern part of South Africa. In those places, those fish tend to live in shallower waters, less than 100 meters. And we can find places where their eggs are on the bottom. And I've done that. I've gone scuba diving and found these egg depositing areas and collected the eggs and the embryos. Got to break some eggs to make an omelet. Has there been any reproduction in captivity? Yes. Some aquaria have had some luck with the eggs. Some of the females will lay eggs in captivity. It seems they store sperm, so they may or may not even have a male around. And they will lay eggs, and they've been able to hatch occasionally an embryo, but they have trouble keeping them alive. Hmm. So they may have some very specialized diet when they're that young and small. How old does a ratfish get to be in life? studies have been done by scientists in New Zealand, it seemed to imply they reached sexual maturity somewhere around five or seven years. And then, you know, they may only live, you know, 10, 20 years. But I don't think we really know. I mean, like, there's a lot of these that live way in the deep sea, and there are these massive beasts. They could be really old. Do they have ostoliths? No, they don't have. You mean otoliths. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> There's Dave again, embarrassing us. Well, I'm not a scientist. I'm a ventriloquist, so I'm allowed to <laughs> make a mistake. Of course my lips ain't moving. I'm a ventriculist. So they're called otoliths, and those are ear bones that accrete rings Yes. for the years that the fishes are alive. But you've said the key term, ear bones. Conjectives don't have bones. Ah. So they're hard to age. They're almost impossible <laughs> to age. So some yeah. of the deep water species might be really, really old. Hey, Dominique, how many, uh, break it down, how many species are there in the world or how many families are there? Oh, well, there's only three families. Okay. There's the group I told you about, the, the hoe-shaped snout. They're called? Those are the elephant fish. Elephant fish, um, big weird um, snout. No, in Latin, what's their Latin name? Calorincidae. That's the family name, yeah, the Calorincidae. And then there's the Rhinochimeridae, which have long pointy snouts. They are crazy looking. Crazy weird looking. I've and seen them. 
There's about eight species of that. I dated one in the 70s. Mm, I remember her. <laughs> and then there's? And then there's the third family, which is the Chimeridae, which are the ones most people are familiar with. They have the bulbous noses, and, and there's like 43 species. So overall, there's 54 named wow. species. How many remaining to be named, do you think? Well, wait, of course, wait, we don't wait, know. Wait, 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 hold on a second. Hold the, hold what? the horses what? What? here. You named one after Ray. I did. Hydrolagus trolli. Yes. Why? Why not? I mean, it's cool. You've done a lot for ratfish, and so you needed to be recognized for that. The cool part about naming a species is when you are the namer, you get to pick the name, and you can name it after anything. And usually it's some attribute of the, the creature, but it, it's, a, it's a way to honor people, to name a species for them, because a species name is forever. So my name will always be associated with coming up the name Hydrolegus trolli. And even if down in history someone finds out Hydrolegus trolli isn't a brand new species that, you know, some new evidence points that it belongs in a different species group, that name will still stick and be recognized. Wait so a minute, I could be unnamed? I, I could be disnamed? I, they'll find out it's something else and trolli isn't valid? Well, and it might be considered a synonym, but it will still be recognized that that fish was given that name at one point uh. in time. And Ray, you'll be long dead and you won't care. That's right. You'll be dead and your kids will be dead, but your name and your fish will live on. Hydrolagus, Dave. <laughs> Explain to me what all that means. What's a what's a hydrolagus and what's a troll eye? Oh, I, you're the troll. Yeah. And why is there an eye at the end? Well, when you name a species, there's these rules to naming a species. We actually have the International Code of Systemic Zoology. This is a, this is a book that describes all the rules, and they meet about every 10 years and update the rules in case, you know, because science changes and stuff. But, but the, the names have to be written in Latin for a species name, and that's because it's a dead language. The language won't evolve or change over time, so the words will always have the same meaning. So troll, for example, is not a Latin word, so you put an I on the end, and that Latinizes it. Oh, got that. And mm -hmm. what does hydrolagus mean? Well, if you break down the Latin, hydro is water, and lagus is a reference to rabbit, water rabbit. Water. And that's another common name that was used for the rat fishing. Why? It looks nothing like a rabbit. Wabbit season. Uh. Oh, yes, it does. If you look at its, its face, like its mouth and its teeth, it's got like these buck teeth tooth plate things. Oh. And they're made of a very special kind of calcified material called Whitlockite. Oh, the same plates you find in a ray, ray. No. No. Similar to more like a lungfish tooth plate. Why are they more like a lungfish than a stingray then? Because of the way they develop and the composition of the, the calcified material. They're ever growing also, right? As right. sharks are always producing teeth, ratfish do the same thing. They're always producing these tooth uh, plates, right? Wait, no, 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 it's different, Ray, it's different. Oh. Sharks are always producing new teeth, so they lose and replace their teeth. When you're born, like a ratfish, you're born with six tooth plates, and that's all you get. Those six tooth plates will continue to grow, but if you lose one or break one, you don't get a new one. Hmm. So they're what you call monophodont, meaning one set of teeth. Like we're diphodont because we have two sets of teeth. Huh. Humans. Are. Yeah, we're chewing away on stuff here. <laughs> Getting my teeth into this. <sighs> Dominique, what do ratfish eat? Apparently they eat just about anything. And it, it turns out that depending on what's available in the area, they'll s exclusively eat that thing. Because of their tooth plates, they eat hard foods. So, for instance, the elephant fish I was studying in New Zealand tended to eat this surf clam known as Maori Mactra. That was a genus. And it was a little tiny surf clam. And if you looked in their guts, that's all you'd see was tons of these shells. And in fact, I was keeping them in captivity and I'd find piles of these shells. I would just go collect them and throw them in there for them to eat. You are also one of the co-authors on the great breakthrough paper on Helicoprion, the buzzsaw shark. Yes. And the buzzsaw shark, basically it looks like it's got many, many teeth, but really it's one root of a tooth that keeps going and spiraling in on itself. Is that how that works? Mm-hmm, yes. And the closest living relative of a buzzsaw shark is actually our little friend, the ratfish. Yes. Really? Yes. How do you have one root but many teeth? Well, you know what? I have tried to avoid studying teeth. I hate the teeth. <laughs> I find the teeth boring. Don't tell your dentist. I know. Shark people love teeth. I'm not exactly positive, but 
it seems the way that the spiral is set up, you know, it's a single unit. You know, when teeth grow, they grow from separate tooth buds. Right. And if I was to speculate from a developmental perspective, that's what I would say. I would say that the world is competent all over to produce teeth but it only gets induced at certain areas when it needs to produce the new tooth. So they're, they're basically kind of crowns coming up off of the root, right? Little spikes. as, as a Yeah, if you root. want to look at it that way. Oh. Yeah, so. The way teeth form is really, really wild because they form from the interaction of two different tissue layers, acroderm and, and basically mesoderm or mesenchyme that moves in. And so those two tissue layers interact with each other. And the one induces the top layer to start forming enamel. That induces the bottom layer to form dentine. And so they, those cell populations communicate with each other to form a tooth. What came before the helicoprion that was anything remotely similar to a spiral whorl of teeth? It's a strange group of sharks called the Eugeniodontids. These are sharks can't even call them sharks because it's kind of before the sharks. These are ratfish sharks, but they have teeth that are being formed at the symphysis, at the meeting of the jaws. Like Edestus? Edestus, the scissor tooth shark. But they're producing teeth right where the jaws meet. And uh, it's very interesting because the teeth are oriented differently. They're coming at you. So these blades are coming out of the center of the jaws and the upper and lower. And there were kind of these half whirls and all these crazy things. There's also the Ineopterygians, Dominique. You know about those a little bit. Yeah, you know about them. Dr. Didier, do you concur with the artist's description? <laughs> with his description of what? <laughs> the teeth? <laughs> well, I've got an artist telling me something about a bunch of sharks, and I've got a person with a doctorate agreeing with him. Ah. <laughs> No, Ray is extremely knowledgeable about know these fossil is. sharks. He spent years looking at them. So I would certainly know that Ray knows his stuff, shall we say. He does. He does. I bow to his paleontological knowledge. Is that on tape, Dave? Did, <laughs> did you get that? Tape is so 1990s, Ray. <laughs> I'm an analog guy, Dave. Ray, why are you obsessed with the ratfish? You've drawn it. You constantly talk about it. Why? <laughs> I can't explain it, Dave. Although, all right, let me attempt. Well, it sounds like rat fink, right? <laughs> so remember rat fink? So, and I've always, uh, you know, been drawn to the uh, underappreciated. And who drew rat fink? Uh, that was Ed Big Daddy Roth. Right. So rat fink as a kid, that was like, this is cool, rat fink. And then when I heard about this fish, rat fish, it's like, no, the name itself is like, cool. and I came to Alaska. And I would just started getting into the world of fish. You open up these fish books, these fish ID books, and usually, as Dominique knows, they actually start with the lowest of the fish, the simplest of the fish, right? Yep. So it'll have hagfish and lampreys, and then the next simplest, dumbest fish is the ratfish. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, that's cool. Isn't that because they're not simple? It's because they have been unchanged through evolutionary history. Right, but in the great world of fish taxonomy, uh, I did not realize that fish ID books were organized. I had no—I was just an artist looking at fish books. Began to realize there was a system to it, and I wanted to catch one of these fish because they look so damn weird. And one day here here in Alaska, I caught one, and there's just something so weirdly different about this fish. I was fascinated with it, and others were horrified by it. Therefore, I was drawn to it, much like the way you and I hang out now, because <laughs> you were a different guy. Anyways, I reached out to Dominique, and I realized that you could talk to uh, PhDs very easily because they were excited to have someone who was interested in their topic. We nerded out, and then I think we talked ratfish. For, I've been talking ratfish with you for 20 years. and I Yeah, never... we've seen the success of our, our ratfish awareness campaign because where I used to be a loner in the ratfish world, I'm finding all kinds of new young scientists interested in ratfish. Really? Lots of new publications coming out on ratfish. I mean, it's exciting. There's like more people in our ratfish world now. What are you working on now? My research direction now is I'm really interested in the snout of Calorhynchus and these electroreceptors. They have some really interesting anatomy in their snout, and no one's really explored that. So my goal was to go to Australia and get these fish and bring them back and then uh, do some studies on, on the anatomy of the snout. Is this the elephant one? The elephant yeah. fish, yes. Yeah. Now, 
I can't do that, but I have two young ladies that are very eager to start working in my lab. So when we get back to the lab, I'm going to get working with them. We'll start some background research and I'll get them started. And we'll, instead of looking at this, the flap of the elephant fish, we'll look at the snout of Hydrolegus coli because I happen to have specimens of that. And that's through dissection and microscopes and tissue samples? Yep. Yeah. You know, Millersville University isn't a big place. We don't have like super fancy high tech equipment. I mean, we have some, but like I don't. So I have this lovely Australian girl and another young and Aussie, woman. Ask yeah. her if she knows David Strassman. See what happens. I, I, I will. <laughs> so, hey, Dominique, do they eat ratfish down in Australia? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They do. And, and in New Zealand. I've eaten it. It's, it's pretty good. Really? Yeah. Yum. They eat it as fish and chips. Um, because they don't have bones, you can get this huge fillet of meat off the sides of the fish and not have to worry about deboning it. Do they exist in schools in large numbers? Yeah, yeah, they aggregate. They tend to sort by sex to some degree. The boys and the girls uh, go yeah. different ways. But you'd have to have large numbers of fish to support a fish and chips industry. Oh, yeah, they'll land like 30,000 tons. Of redfish? In the southern hemisphere. Well, here in the northern hemisphere, people were stunned to find out that Puget Sound, 75% of the biomass of Puget Sound was estimated to be nothing but ratfish. So they could do these midwater trawls and put stuff on the deck. People always think of Puget Sound as salmon and orcas, but no, it was full of ratfish. Why? And why is a good question, but also people up here would never ever think to eat them. Apparently we could, couldn't we? Yeah, I suppose. I think when it comes to the species that occurs in Puget Sound, the Hydrolagus coli, they don't get very large. So each fish is not going to have a lot of meat. Ah. The other thing is the chondrichthys store urea in their tissues. They don't last a long time. Like, like if you wanted to have them for long-term storage or shipping, they're not too good. So most of the places that fish them, it's local markets only. Is that the ammonia smell I sometimes smell when I have fish, like halibut or a rockfish? No, that's, the, that's just a fish that's old and don't eat it. Gross. But sharks purposely have a metabolism that they store urea. It serves an important purpose in terms of their osmoregulation. Osmoregulation is the control of water levels and mineral ions in the blood. I quit eating maguro sushi 10, 15 years ago, which is bluefin tuna, out of support for the overfishing of that species. And I stopped eating sushi maybe three years ago because there's a sushi restaurant in every city on the planet, and I believe it is decimating our oceans of everything. Do you have similar thoughts or feelings about overfishing or sustainable aquaculture? Oh, we're devastating our oceans. There's no doubt about it. And I mean, I don't I wouldn't just blame the sushi market. I mean, it's everything. It's people wanting more seafood because we want a, a better diet. It's overpopulation. I mean, places that really rely on seafood. Look at parts of India and in the Philippines and these small islands. The populations are huge, massive. There are just so many people on this planet. We just can't feed them all. Um, and we, we can't rely on, on these wild sources. We just continue to overfish, continue to expand our gear and get better and better and more efficient techniques and the popu without even understanding fully how the populations work. Yet I see populations of ratfish in Puget Sound are overwhelming. Why are there so many there? Because you fished out everything else. Winner! Is it simply that, you think? Yeah. Nobody wants them. them, nobody eats them. Do other predators, who eats a ratfish? Nothing eats a ratfish except, you know, maybe other sh other sharks do. I had some sharks eat my ratfish. So another shark will eat it. Because they've know. got a big dorsal fin spine that's very nasty, yeah. right? You know, some things can eat that. But the point here is by overfishing, we change the ecology of the oceans worldwide. And in fact, I've been talking to people at the Washington State Department of Fisheries, and they're actually not finding the abundance of ratfish anymore. They're, they're actually, it's getting harder to find ratfish. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. The day is over. Yeah, so we're impacting our ocean. I mean, it, it may be too late. It's, we're never going to get the oceans back. But we can hopefully bring back something different that would be comparable or give us the same life-sustaining capabilities. I had an idea for sustainable fisheries, and that would be to make massive 50-mile nets in the middle of the Pacific where there's no traffic, no nothing. Because the oceans are basically deserts with life concentrated near the shore or at sea mounds. And 
it would take a logistics of ships to tend to these massive farms, but that's the place to do it, out in the middle of the Pacific where there's nothing. They're already doing that. Really? They've got a, a, a design of these giant round cages, um, and they, you know, they're massive. Uh, I think they've been doing it in the Pacific, trying to raise fish there, um, hoping to avoid the kind of impacts that you get at coastal fisheries with the buildup of waste and, and, and so on. Yeah. And I think that they have some success, but the problem is you have to anchor that somehow, uh, you do have to go out. It's a way offshore and maintain them. But here's the other problem we have. Fish fish farming is not going to save us because a lot of fish we can't farm. We just plain and simple can't farm them. Tunas, we just can't farm. What they do to farm tunas is they go out and capture a bunch of larvae and then throw them in a cage. I swam with the yellowfin in South Australia near Port Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And the guy's telling me how sustainable it is. Well, what do you feed them? He goes, oh, three, four tons of bait fish. fish. Yeah. yeah. I said, well, where do you get that from? They went, Indonesia. Oh, so it's not sustainable, is it? You're taking the bottom of the food chain to feed someone else's plate. Check, please. In fact, people think of fisheries, and you also you think, oh, it's all us eating sushi that's wiping it out. Roughly a third of fishes that are caught of the fishery globally is to feed animals, not us. So 30% of our global fisheries isn't even going to humans. It's going to chickens or to fish farm or fertilizer for plants. You know, it's a third of the fisheries is not even to feed us, but to feed animals. Hmm. You're right. They're fishing the bottom of the food chain. Then there's all the bycatch that we don't use or we dump yeah, back in. throw away. So it's not one thing that's causing it. It's not just sushi markets or red lobster. It's the way we view our oceans. It's the tragedy of the commons because the oceans have always been considered for everybody. And so everybody right. overuses it. Hey, on that bleak note, um, <laughs> <laughs> let me, let me, uh, we're all going to die. Yeah, we are all going to die. So that, that is true. So, but on a brighter note, uh, this is a paleo show. Uh, Dominique, have you ever had a thing for fossils or gone fossil hunting yourself? I went fossil hunting out in um, Kemmer, Wyoming, and the, the Green River. I went out there with Lance Grandy one year. Oh, wow. Blast. Really had fun collecting the fossils out there. You know, in our local area, you know, the, the Chesapeake Bay region, there's some fossil collecting areas where you can get shark's teeth and a variety of... Uh, Calvert Cliffs. Calvert Cliffs. That's been fun to do that. And sometimes when I'm at the beach, I'll look for shark teeth. So I dabble occasionally, but I'm not quite a paleo nerd. I'm sorry. <laughs> Why, this is a disgrace. <laughs> it's okay, but you know, I mean, uh, you have a deep appreciation for paleontology. You've worked with paleontologists. Oh, You've yeah. been part of the buzz saw shark paper and all that. So how is science going to save us? Here's the big question, huh? Can it? You know what, Ray? <laughs> science can only save us if we have an educated public that understands and appreciates science. Good luck with that. That's the only way science is going to save us. Well, you make science fun, right? You can engage <laughs> the kids, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I want everybody to like science. Science is for everybody. And it's it's not hard. It's not complicated. It's not Scientists aren't trying to pull the wool over your eyes. And, and I think people get too afraid and feel deceived because somewhere along the line, someone told them it was difficult. Look at the science. Science has answers. It doesn't have all the answers. But that's why we need people to understand it. Because the more smart minds that are thinking scientifically, that are understanding it, the more ideas we'll have, the more solutions we'll have. Dominique, that was brilliant. Oh, thanks. See you at an Australian fish and chip shop eating <laughs> redfish. <laughs> well, thank you, Dominique. That was really awesome with Dominique, wasn't it? Yeah, it was really fun. Uh, we got really way deep into uh, the sexual mechanics of ratfish, but it was good for me. How about you, Dave? Yeah, it was good for me, but I really want to go to Australia and have some ratfish fish and chips. That should be awesome. I'm not sure I'm quite up for that yet. I'd like to go to Australia, but I can't eat a ratfish, man. I don't know. It's just not right. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll buy you a package and you won't even know what you're eating. You'll fool me into it. All right. But hey, next time, let us uh, we've done the biology thing, which is rooted in paleo, but let's go total paleo. Eh? Yeah. Let's do fossils, dinosaurs, arr, that kind of stuff. Arr. Let's go deep. Let's go paleo. Let's go old. Let's go deep time. Thank you for listening to Paleo Nerds. Make sure to like and subscribe on iTunes or wherever you're listening. 
If you want to learn more about what you heard today, check out our website, paleonerds.com. You'll find tons of pictures and links, including photographic evidence that today's guests and your hosts have been paleo nerds for a long, long time. Again, that's paleonerds.com. Thanks for listening.